All right, I'm here with Chrissy Saunders, who is the co-founder and CEO at CS2, which is, I would say, a leading go-to-market operations consultancy. Chris Walker just recently joined as an advisor. And today we decided to talk all things go-to-market operations. Uh, Chrissy, thank you for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. So maybe let's start with definitions. How would you say go-to-market operations or GTM ops is different to rev ops, sales ops, marketing ops? I think it all often bleeds into each other. So how would you define it? Yeah. So I chose this topic today and I think everyone like kind of you know, come along this journey. I think for some people who have been a long time listener of like our own podcast or watching CS2, I think we very much have shied away in more recent years of kind of like identifying ourselves with like a certain group, like marking ops, rev ops, um, anything like that, mainly because we felt like both of the two of those or sales ops or anything just didn't really encapsulate um, kind of what we do for clients very well. But I think now as we've kind of built what we call revenue growth architecture for clients, which is basically the foundation that they need to set up their go-to-market strategies, bring them to market and like report on them, kind of feels like we're more in like the camp um, of GTM ops or go-to-market ops. Um, And so that's a more kind of, you know, recent thing. I think some people have stayed away from using the term go-to-market because I think that in the past that has kind of, I don't know, put out like, oh, you're working on identifying ICP and persona and stuff like that. But when Mm. you add operations to it, it's really just around like, how do you operationalize all the different go-to-market strategies? And we are very much in the camp of like a unified approach to doing that. Because I think companies will confuse and think, oh, okay, we want to do ABM now. So like, what is... how do we set that up? Like, what do we do operationally to do that? Um, or, oh, now we have another good market strategy. We want to do PLG and so forth. And I think, you know, realistically that there's a main foundation that you can set up or you can just add on and test out different go-to-market strategies. And yes, there might be nuances and different things that you do for that, but building a good kind of base and foundation so that you can um, report on things in the same way um, get insight into th- how things are working the right way and and things aren't always so like separate. So that's kind of like our our approach and I'll talk a little bit about some of the nuances to that. But I think RevOps right now has just always been a struggle for us because it includes a lot of sales ops things, deal desk. A lot of the times a sales ops leader will then get that group. And then another thing that happens is like marking ops will join and that person just doesn't really understand the the major nuances of what it's like in marketing ops traditionally. Um, And then also at the same time, marketing ops has taken on more of the tasks or even expertise that traditionally people would think is more on like the CRM side or, um, you know, on the account side, tracking accounts for target accounts, um, like ABM, um, the funnel architecture. So how leads you know, our process through sales and SDRs and how you report on that and how, you know, report on your funnel and so forth. So the gamut of like what like a marketing ops person, at least a good one does, has expanded. It, you know, mm-hmm. it's not just like the campaigns and setting up campaigns and execution or your marketing automation platform. But then RevOps is still kind of um, a bit more focused on maybe more of the traditional sales ops, forecasting, um, purchase order, CPQ, all that, which uh, to to us is not go to market operations. It's more like finance operations or more traditional sales operations and so forth. So yeah, that's where I think is the difference. And I, I, I've seen some folks actually recently use go to market ops as well, which is a good sign, but you should own um, it. But yeah, <laughs> you need to own it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one, this is a super qu- stupid question, and I'm sure to someone like you who th- who's been in this space for a long time, you'll roll your eyes, but I feel like it's my job also to kind of ask stupid questions. So when I hear RevOps, Marketing Ops, go to Market Ops, in my head, what I'm thinking of not being in this space, let's say, or doing it is uh, you're connecting a bunch of tools with Zapier. <laughs> 
you know, like you're you're making sure that when a lead books a call on the website, it then gets automatically added to the CRM and then it triggers some notification here that sends a marketing automated email and like you're connecting all of these things and you're helping automate certain workflows and that's what ops is. What, what how wrong am I? Um I would say that you're like maybe partially right where you're describing maybe about 5% of what's included in the, in go to market up. So, but I do think you're describing a a part of like the foundation. Traditionally, recently we've called like that foundation revenue growth architecture. And mainly because there's a lot of processes in place that like you just need out the bat. And it usually is surrounded around like what people call like an inbound motion Mm -hmm. or your, you know, demand gen or demand creation, um, kind of like that whole buyer journey as someone gets connected to you. And yeah, sometimes that would be kind of using a tool like Zapier or, you know, some automations within your market automation Mm -hmm. platform or whatnot to ensure that that lead per se then gets, you know, routed properly, you're alerting sales, you're only sending the ones that are actually in ICP and the right fit and are ready to talk to sales over to sales. And that's all very much a a big part of it, but that's only kind of one source and and kind of one stream. There's a lot of different kind of signals or, um, you know, sources of demand that can come, you know, come through based on what your go-to-market strategy is. You might have, you know, a PLG motion Mm -hmm. and you want to be able to track um, kind of product usage and then define like when someone should actually be a PQL that could be included in in go-to-market operations Um, or even as much as like, how are you tracking, you know, deal reg from partners and how are you then sending those leads over to the channel Um, sales team to prosecute. So there's all these different kinds of sources of demand. And so when we think about go-to-market ops is you are kind of unifying that all together. So you're building out the operations for every way that you can get demand or that you're building or creating campaigns to generate demand um, and then making sure that you have the right process for um for handling them, for bringing things to market, for reporting on it, um, and then using that reporting to then improve your go-to-market strategy or your cam- you know campaigns and so forth. So, um, yeah, the I think that we call it usually like fun, like kind of funnel architecture. And what mm-hmm. you're talking about is like a new lead coming through mm-hmm. um, has traditionally been part of that or like the order of operations, you know, like what are all the things you need to do to a lead before they can be handed over to to sales and making sure that that's firing the right way. But um, yeah, there's just a, it's lot, way more than a lot more to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. But you're describing a very important piece, which is interesting. Um, and it can be executed so many different ways. Um, but I, I think also for small companies, they might be thinking that that is the mm-hmm. main piece because that might be the only way that they're really capturing demand right now. Right. Um, but as your company gets more sophisticated, you're adding in more go-to-market strategies, um, then it becomes a lot more um, that you need to manage. And so we usually work with companies who are like series C to all the way like post um, IPO Got as it. they're in this like kind of embarking on sophisticating their operations and need to ensure that they're able to report on on and manage and set up the right process for all, all of it. Got it. I th- what, what do they call it in like development? There's like technical debt or something. Tech so debt, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's probably lots of like ops debt or like go to market ops debt where they've like stuck together a bunch of tools yes. and like and now it's like holy shit now that we have so many people and we're onboarding people and all of that it's like no one really understands how this machine works anymore and we need to bring <laughs> some structure and order and and uh you know orchestration into this monster that we've built yes i think that you are describing probably like the crux of like what most companies um experience especially early stage companies 
I think that companies underestimate and and it's hard, right? If you're an early stage company, you don't have like loads of cash to spend. Like you're also in this experimental phase where maybe you don't want to over process to something because your business might change very rapidly. Um, But we tried to trim that down and be like, okay, well, even if you know that you're going to like do, you know, PLG later or do some type of self-serve, or maybe you haven't fully defined your ABM strategy because, you know, you're just bringing to market maybe like one wedge. You're trying to even figure out who your ICP is. You can have a certain foundation like your lead prioritization, like you're like you're talking about the buyer experience order of operations, um, like even your funnel tracking, having a process for what happens to um, someone who is now sales ready. And then how do you track that all the way back to pipeline? Those are all things that you can t- start to set up from day one and do it the right way. But the problem is a lot of companies just see it as we'll get to that one day. Yeah. <laughs> and then the problem is that they get to that day and then they're like, I want to be able to report on all of this hey, marketing ops person who just started this week or, you know, hey, team who we've just inundated with so much to do, go and do that. And the the fact of the matter is, like, they will encounter all this tech debt they have to unravel. They will, um, you know, have to spend a lot of time trying to get everyone on the same page of, you know, how we're going to build this foundation. So we're kind of big fans of taking the approach of, focusing on the foundations first. Yes, you don't have to over-process like experiments, like say, you know, little things like, oh, oh, we had a client who was like, we want to do customer referrals and have these like ways that we can credit back the client based on if they put in a customer referral. And, you know, I was like, okay, we could do a lot of work to help do that because everything we do is very much around data. But I'm like, why don't you just see how many customer referrals you get. <laughs> They're a very small company right. and they don't have a ton of customers. And unfortunately they don't have a huge influx of customer referrals yet. So it's like, okay, let's just not build the yeah. tech deck because you might change that program, you know, soon. So um, I so, think that it, it takes kind of like knowing what to build now from like the early yeah. stage and what you can not have to build process around the, like now and build it later. So I know that go to market ops is, you know, we're kind of just defining it and you guys are leading the way here, but if you would have to, when is it the right time you think for a person to bring in a go to market ops person at what stage? And is this a manager level role? Is this a director level role? And then last question to string on to that, given that this is not established yet, do you think it's better to bring in a RevOps person, a marketing ops person and have them grow into that? Or how do you think about the profile of the person that you would, how you would source this person? So I would say that you could take two approaches. You could hire people to do it in-house or you can work with an agency who can be embedded with your company and really figure out what's the right thing. Yep. But having someone internally to be that champion to evangelize like why you're setting up the process you can then maybe inherit it too and kind of keep it going and that usually can be like maybe someone who's more traditionally marketing ops um is a bit better for that mainly because they understand the marketing strategy mm-hmm. and, th- and that's the thing where i think it makes makes sense with go to market ops is you understand like the goals of the revenue team what they're trying to do, how they're trying to um, target their, you know, prospects, what the um, buyer experience should look like, and all of that. Really, it's just really like what's what's good marketing, what's good sales. But you know, it's a it's a it's a group effort, and so a marketing outsourcer might be good for that. Mm-hmm. I will say the alternatively, if you're going to hire people in house, I would say a marketing ops person joint with like a rev ops or sales ops person, because sometimes building a lot of this stuff, you need to have the expertise of both. You might need, a, right. you know, someone to manage the the CRM side of things, be able to enable the sales team. So because it's all about data, like if. If you create a sales ready lead or what people call MQL, even if you have like the best process to get that to sales, if they don't know then 
how to prosecute that? Like, how, where do I find that lead? Like, what do I do with them now? How do I follow up on them? Um, what do I do when I book a meeting? Is that an opportunity at stage zero? And so there's some processes that you need to build on the CRM side. So having a kind of a really good sales operate, well, more like CRM uh, admin, which I don't like saying sales ops. It's more of like an admin on the CRM side can be Mm -hmm. a really good counterpart, but those Two people working very closely together. And I think that is where RevOps came about. People are like, oh, we have these teams that are so disparate from each other. Let's just put them onto one team and call it RevOps. (laughs) But then the problem is now you just see companies where, what's your RevOps team? Oh, it's just one person. And they're on the set, like kind of the sales side, they report into a CRO or a head of sales. I'm like, that's not rev ops. (laughs) That is sales ops basically. But then maybe you're just, you know, getting them to do more than what they traditionally should do. So um, I think that the thing with what rev ops was missing is like the understanding of alignment. And so uh, with go-to-market operations, I think you still kind of need someone on the CRM side who can help kind of bring the things to fruition. But of course, this depends on the state of the company, but that's what I would say. So I know that you're hesitant to put a stake in the ground, but if you had, let's say you find that person, the go-to-market ops person who can combine those things, mar- marketing ops, and they 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 understand the CRM and the sales ops side too. Do you hire yeah. them at a million ARR, at 10 million ARR? You know, at what stage does it make sense to properly give this a role, someone who manages internally and sure they can leverage external resources, bring you guys in as an expert, but someone who owns this internally, like at what stage of the revenue growth journey do you see this roughly? If you're VC backed, I would say like you could make the case to do it as early as possible if you know that you're going to grow. So I would, but I think traditionally we think 5 million ARR yep. like minimum. So like the B is like, roughly? Yeah. Yeah. That's where I think you really need to start thinking about it. You could make the case for even earlier. Um, but let, let's be honest, like if you have like a million ARR, you're probably more focused on your product. Like, yeah. and that's what I would say too. A lot of um marketing or sale, you know, revenue team problems sometimes isn't even down to like the process. It might even be how good your product is, what the ICP fit is. And so I would say at that very early stage, you need to be more focused on hiring a really good marketer and also investing more in your product and engineering. Cause without a good product, like you could have the best process in the world, but you're likely not going to have customers. You're not going to have happy customers. Um, and then if you don't know how to really understand who like the product market fit, and if that's completely off, then you're not really going to see success in your campaign. So it's kind of like good operations doesn't fix a bad marketing right. strategy. And I think that's <laughs> I think that's where companies struggle too. I think they look at we're not hitting our goals and it must mean, you know, I know they're probably thinking maybe there's something wrong with the strategy, but a lot of the time too, there's this awareness of like, we need to fix our operations. We need more data. We need all the stuff. And it's like, well, I think actually maybe go back and look at like, is there just a product market fit with the, with the product is, or is your targeting just completely off? And actually operations can probably give you the (laughs) reports to figure that out. But, um, you can't out process or out market a bad product. So that early, early stage, I would say invested into the brand side, the marketing side, um, and then the product side. I think it was Frank Grillo from like a video years back. He said, if you automate bad underperforming marketing, you'll just get more bad underperforming marketing. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that happens a lot too, where we see marketing teams want to just continue to do the same thing, really. But you're giving them data that's saying, hey, don't do that same thing. But then Mm. they just keep doing the same thing. (laughs) But they're like, but maybe this time it'll be better. Maybe if we just target more people. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Honestly, I think sometimes it's even down to like, uh, oh, let's just go up volume. They think if we just do more campaigns, show the board that we're doing enough, um, target more cold leads, which, you know, like doesn't work. 
And I think there's in this, I'm an operations person, but like, I think there's an overemphasis sometimes on tracking things to just like at the mercy of doing the right marketing. Like right. they're like, Oh, I'm only going to do things that I can really prove the ROI on. But right. you know, running a business, I know that there's things like this, like a podcast that are just so hard to track, but it doesn't mean you stop doing it. Yeah. The, and, and there are ways to get a pulse on if that's working. It just might not show up on a dashboard. So that yeah. that's another realization that I think, um, people don't quite understand. I think they do. They do now a little bit. Um, that's what I think Chris does a really great job. Chris Walker does a really great job of kind of talking about that. Um, so do some other marketers, but I, I think we still have a, a, a way to pull that back um, and kind of focus on just doing good marketing and totally, then pro- totally. and putting process behind that. Just to give Chris double credit here, uh, obviously talks about self-reported attribution, which which we have installed, which we install with every customer we work with. And uh, recently I interviewed him on this podcast and then they shared it on their podcast, The Revenue Vitals, because they reshared it. And a CMO listened to it, came inbound, said self-reported attribution, found you through Chris Chris Walker's podcast, became a customer. So, you know, it it works. And we know for sure that being featured on Chris's podcast is a good thing. You know, um, 100%. and uh, I will double tap on that. And we do the same thing at CS2. And we were on Chris's podcast recently where they, he announced our advisory um, and partnership. And we got an inbound saying, found you or heard about you from the Revenue Vitals podcast. So there you yeah. go. <laughs> there you go. Chris driving demand for other people. <laughs> um, when you said, you know, that, uh, there was this new term of revenue ops and there was kind of this hope that it would unify and then it was really turned out to be sales ops in disguise. Um, I feel like the same thing kind of happened with like the CRO role, the chief revenue officer, where people were like, oh, it's going to like unify. And then it's just like, no, they're just a head of sales, like their chief sales officer. Um, And so maybe there's some opportunity for soon to be a chief go-to-market officer. But my question Mm -hmm. to you is, where do you see the go to um, go to market operations person sit within the organization are they a director are they a vp are they at the c level where where do I you see between, that leader uh between director all the way to vp and i think that they would report to a cmo likely um if there's a really good cro and and there are always, always caveats to the case i've seen some cro's who um actually have a marketing background and mm-hmm. Not to say that a sales a salesperson can't be a zero, but there's just so much to understand when it comes to marketing, right. and a salesperson tr- traditionally doesn't really fully under understand that. So, I do think that someone who has a background in marketing, if you can find marketing and sales, even better, um, is better suited for that role be- because there's so much to that goes into you know bringing campaigns to market. Um, the reporting aspects to that. Um, Cause the salesperson actually, if you think about it, isn't even still even focused on data at all traditionally mm-hmm. or reports. They're not like, they're not literate in that. They just right. look at what's my forecast. What's my team telling me that's their commit. Maybe they have some people create reports for them to track that. That's well, like pretty much, you know, it. They, they're better at understanding how to get a deal done. Um, and, and granted, there's probably people out there that are a bit more savvy than that. But I think when it comes to the the strategy, the strategy and the underlying data that you need to understand, even if you're not built, obviously not building yourself, a CMO is usually more kind of inclined to understand that. And I think that's one benefit of like the, I talked about a negative to marketers and people who are on the marketing side being too focused on what you can track, but mm-hmm. at the same time. I think they've been pressured to bring that data to the table, to the board um, board meetings and so forth, way more than maybe a salesperson. And so, be, be, so because they've had to do that, they're just more literate in understanding data, which, mm. is, which is great. Or they know how to kind of tie those things together or create a narrative or understand that you need to qu- quickly change, you know, fail fast and, and, and things like that. And, and how to actually show improvement. And so that's what I think a revenue team has to do collectively. Um, so a CRO, I feel like maybe a CMO moving into that might be a bit better. 
So in five years, we'll have a VP of GTM Ops reporting into the CMO. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you have any sense of why? I mean, marketing and sales have always, or it seems like traditionally been separate. And it seems like in recent conversation, part of it is go to market ops. You guys see that. And I think Chris Walker talks about, you know, go to market strategy, that mm -hmm. that should sit above. Do you have any sense why now this conversation is happening that instead of saying, no, there's marketing and then there's sales and they're separate and we keep them separate. There are two departments. We're now having these conversations about unifying them and it's all really go to market and they should both sit underneath go to market. Like why now? Do you have any sense? I think there's been a long enough time where people have realized that a, a, a big part of the issues that revenue teams face is like a lack of alignment and that's creating like a horrible buyer experience. And I think before, mm -hmm. like in the heyday, I would say, um, you know, prior to, you know, last year, you know, I think 2023 was a turning point for a lot of businesses, especially in tech. And they couldn't just like lean on their laurel laurels anymore. There wasn't just this focus on, you know, net new client acquisition, because it's hard, you know, companies are cutting their budgets. And so there was a big focus on your customers. I think that that also uncovered the like issues that people already knew were there between the alignment between sales and marketing and marketing was doing their thing, tracking MQLs only, you know, maybe they were being measured on that and gold on that. And then they sent them over to sales <laughs> sales doesn't hit their goal, but marketing it does. Right. But or maybe sales does hit their goal, but it's because they, you know, source their own deals. Yeah, and they could have probably, and they probably had a bad conversion rate from like net new meeting to like close customer, but it was enough to kind of keep them growing because they had more demand probably than they needed, or they had the teams big enough to to prosecute that or is the only goal that their board was actually getting them to report on. Um, but when you are struggling, you're always going to feel those like breaking points, the leakage. You can't have any revenue or pipeline leakage when you uh, have, you know, when you're struggling. And also you need to show success in order to get more money and the scrutiny around getting money to continue growth from venture capitalists is, a margin like it's like 10 percent of what like traditionally was in like mm -hmm. past years i think i saw a report so so yeah and then so i think that because of that i think there's now this more this focus on okay well let's take a more standardized let's take a more like unified approach i think also too they there's just this um when you have like less resources, smaller teams, especially on the marketing ops side, which we are marketing ops, sales ops, revenue ops, any operations teams have always been traditionally understaffed. And so for me, I think a big, a big selling point for unifying operations um, or the go-to-market operations and having a foundation there that you can track all of your uh, go-to-market strategies effectively makes sense because you don't want to just like reinvent the wheel and rebuild things just for one strategy that takes a lot of resources to manage, right. um, which pe companies don't have. Um, and in some ways it might simplify things too. Um, when you're getting everyone to kind of join together and figure out like the right strategy. So, um, this is a good question. I'm having to kind of like think on, on yeah, the spot, yeah, yeah. but I, I would say that that probably is a reason for like, why now? But also I think there's a little bit about around like the sophistication of kind of technology and what you can do with it that has also kind of come out of that. And so I think traditionally people who have come through marketing operations, they were like, what they were focused on was like a sliver, but as that's expanded and they have to focus on the full kind of lead all the way to close one revenue and even beyond that, that's where it's required market ops people to overlap into kind of what I said, it's not really marketing ops anymore. It's go to market ops. Um, and then also people on maybe rev ops side are having to now think about what's going on on the marketing side or their platforms and how that data is entering CRM and so forth. So I think you can't, you can't have them not aligned. You can't have that right. like full picture. You can't just, but 
I think, and then having those silos just created <laughs> so many issues, even yeah. down to teams pointing fingers at each other. Totally. Oh, you say you're hitting your goal. Well, we're not, you know, yeah. or we should get credit for this pipeline because, you know, it was an outbound motion, but it's like marketing is still, you know, reaching out to them. And, and all that really does is it doesn't create a better experience for the buyer doesn't sell, create more pipeline. And I think there's been enough of that that it needs to change. I'll, I'll throw in a theory too, even though I'm not qualified to have a theory here that I just thought of. I think sales seems to have always been easily quantifiable because you know how many conversations you had, you know mm -hmm. how many you closed into customers and you know exactly how much revenue they're generated. Always been easy to see the performance. Marketing seems to have been, I'm reading Ogilvy, the Ogilvy on advertising, that there, there was no data. Like if you put in a newsletter ad or a TV ad, there was some data, but you couldn't really track it. So it was a lot more wizardry and common sense of understanding like what psychology might drive someone to maybe reach out, but you didn't yeah. have real like real time data. Like they literally mm -hmm. had to do market research where you, you had to put someone next to that billboard on the road and like press a clicker. <laughs> to count how many cars drive by and then you need to make some guess of what the demographic of those people driving by is based on where the road is leading and then you know we we're now able to track all these things in marketing and people were like oh we can now do data-driven marketing but then they realized that if you optimize marketing for metrics that marketing cares about like mqls that are proxies for revenue but not really revenue you get misalignment because marketing figures out how to game the MQL game that don't really turn into revenue. And so now you're realizing, oh, we need to align them a little better and not give marketing a proxy. We need to mm -hmm. tie them directly to revenue and not MQLs or something like that. So you guys have a bird's eye view on go-to-market operations because you work with a lot of companies and you come in there and you do things. What are some of the more common mistakes or patterns that you see or maybe low-hanging fruit that you often find yourself implementing first because they just have a big impact and they almost always are neglected? Do certain things come to mind here? Yeah. Um, you kind of described a little bit of that at the beginning. You're like, well, it's someone who comes to your forms and says they want to be reach out to sales and um, or contact sales and so forth. That whole like inbound process is usually low hanging fruit because there's usually some inefficiencies there that we find. Like even down to there's people that are requesting to be contacted that they might even have an issue with getting that person over to sales due to like sync errors or between systems. Like as minute, minute you know, minute as that, all the way to like their routing's wrong and that person doesn't know, or they just don't have a process around it. We always traditionally start what we call like the foundation, which is maybe more of like an inbound or demand gen kind of foundation. Cause you can add and layer onto that. So that usually includes, um, kind of the lead processing, like buyer experience, um, the uh, like order of operations of how you set the data for that person so they can go through all that properly. Um, the like sales handoff and routing, how they're be following up with your leads. Um, what happens to them after that? Like, do they go to a sales engagement platform, blah, blah, blah. And then the funnel, uh, we call it funnel, but the way that we track a funnel isn't like so linear. You can actually, so I can say this very quickly. We have some po past podcasts a lot on this and I think we talked about it on Chris's podcast, but um, the way that we track like a buyer funnel is using a custom object, but also the way that we track it is that you can enter a funnel at different stages. It might even be a salesperson. Sorry, just a quick question. Does this only sure. apply to PLG or also sales-led motions? It can apply to... All okay. of it. That's okay. kind of like our, our funnel tracking, which is great is, and the process around it is you can have it, you can basically tailor it to, and like any, any channel or source that demand is coming mm -hmm. from, even down to outbound. Like mm -hmm. if say that your rep saw, there was like a news article about their target account and then they find, you know, two people people they want to reach out to, they move them into a working status. Um, and they basically have deemed that as now sales ready because sales is reaching out to them. And then they want to set up a meeting 
So tracking setting up that meeting, then it gets converted to real pipeline, then close one revenue. So the, and we track it on a custom object because we want to be able to track multiple journeys. As you know, like you can kind of close out a journey and Mm -hmm. so you could tie that and you have that history. Um, And then also being able to um, account for issues that CRMs traditionally have, especially Salesforce, where those you could have a leader or contact or existing contact can go into a funnel. And is this literally like a funnel view? Like it, where does this sit? Does this sit in HubSpot and Salesforce, a custom tool? It will sit in Salesforce traditionally uh-huh. for our clients. You could probably build something similar in um, HubSpot, but we have um, pretty much a hundred percent of our clients use Salesforce. So I will caveat that. Um, but it is an unmanaged package that we build and then it creates a custom object that's tied to a lead and contact. And so the reporting that you would build would just be a special report type for the, uh, for the funnel and it would join that data together. And then we'll also track like the, and this is going a little bit into the weeds, but, um, we track the kind of the sources for what started that funnel. So some people call that like signals now recently, Mm -hmm. Um, other times people call it like tipping point, just what was the thing that they either did or what started that funnel that could even be from, you know, a PQL who showed enough interest. It could be from an event and an, like a certain event campaign. Yep. It could be from ads and then knowing exactly what offer that they converted on, or it could even be outbound. So they haven't had marketing history, rec- like marketing campaign history that happened recently, a rep goes in, starts working it. We'll actually track that back automatically to like an outbound. You can even tie that back to a certain outbound play or anything like that. So being able to run your funnel reporting to know like what channels and also the specific specifics around like the type of campaigns for that channel that started those funnels and what which one are actually converting to meetings and then to pipeline to close one revenue that's what we'll set up for clients. And that data will help with revenue planning because you'll actually, like you said, MQLs have traditionally been a proxy, but it's only been that because they weren't able to really well like tie that back to revenue. But mm. when you can, you can actually create a better goal for a sales ready lead or MQL. We call it sales ready because it doesn't always just come from marketing. That's the difference for us too. You can start a funnel, even if it doesn't like score up, it could start right when a salesperson starts working it, or even if a something goes straight to opportunity. So a partner sends you over an opportunity, you yep. still want to track um, a funnel for that. So um, that's a different to us. We think of it as like a unified um, funnel architecture um, as far as our unified go-to-market um, architecture. But with that tracking, um, it will um, account for everything. And that's the big issue that I think other marketing teams have done too, where it's been a bit confusing, where it only started at like MQL and an MQL was just deemed as, you know, based on what behavior they've had. But you're missing out on so many other ways right. that people can enter your funnel. And then you're missing out on, those are different go-to-market strategies. An outbound or ABM strategy doesn't always just start with an MQL. You might have your teams, you know, doing some ABM plays. This would still track that PLG the same way. Um, Partner, where you're maybe getting opportunities directly the same way, that might not be tracked. And so with this approach, the way we set up the measurement, you can get insight into all those different sources or signals or whatnot. So basically sounds like the one lead handoff or like handoff to sales, like how do leads being handed off to sales, streamlining that and making sure there is no leakage. Um, How do people enter your ecosystem and making sure that that's easy for people and then building this whole funnel view that Mm -hmm. includes inbound, outbound, all kinds of pipeline sources so that people can make good decisions and actually have all the data in one place that is not suddenly, you know, you you can actually make data informed decisions. Yeah. And I think traditionally goals have been set based on just volume or people look at performance at a volume, like how many opportunities have we generated? How many MQLs have we generated? And they're always just looking at like a number, but actually where you can find quick wins and improvements and efficiencies is around 
um, conversion rates and velocities like through the stages. So if you have a really poor conversion rate from like meeting book to pipeline opportunity, Mm -hmm. you want to be able to see that. You want to see like, is there a certain source or is there like a certain owner of like who's creating these meetings or is there a certain, you know, industry and we can see all that and it helps you make those quick um, decisions as a marketing team to maybe make change. Um, and then, um, that sounds like a dream, is- by the way, I don't have, <laughs> I don't have to, I mean, I'm a super small company, but that sounds, that, that sounds awesome. I want that. <laughs> and then velocity too, right? Like if you know that and you know, you're an agency, so you probably don't have like that many issues around velocity, but for some companies, you know, they might have issues where there's people that are, um, you know, sitting in a certain stage too long, um, or they can improve like the time that it's going from sales ready to closed one. Um, so being able to see certain velocity metrics from stage to stage, right. um, is great too for uncovering that. Right. Cause I think that's the thing that you want for your revenue team is that data to just make decisions, make improvements where I think traditionally everyone has thought of this data to like prove we're doing the right thing, prove we're meeting the goals, show volume, show enough. It's like, well, yeah, you can say you have 200 sales ready leads, but what does that even matter really? If like none of them are converting, it doesn't matter at all, to be honest. I mean, I guess it comes down to to be able to solve a problem. You need to first know that you have a problem. And for that, you need visibility. Last question. I know there's a little bit of a gimmicky question, but I still want to ask it. You know, there's all kinds of tools, go-to-market tools, and there's new ones popping up every single Mm -hmm. day. And I'm sure people focus way too much on tools rather than, you know, building a good foundation. But is there any tool that you've recently discovered that you fell in love with, that you're using, that you're recommending to people that you feel like is maybe not doesn't not known by everyone yet? Does anything come to mind? Oh, not known by anyone yet? Hmm. No, I mean, it, it can be it can be not, you know. <laughs> um, this is a really good question. I, I will say that there are some that are on my radar that I haven't even used yet, but I'm okay. very interested in seeing. Tell me, what's that short list? Um, so there's one called Clay. Yep, it's on my short list too. <laughs> it's on your short, okay. Um, and they, yeah, so they just do kind of like using AI, they're automating kind of outbound plays. Yep. And I think that that's an area for disruption. And I think traditionally people have thought about sales engagement platforms like outreach and sales often and stuff like that for um, running their outbound plays. But the I think there's a lot more orchestration that goes into it. There's more like crafting a um, message that um, you need to think about. Um, the, there's the data acquisition mm-hmm. to actually get those people into the sequence. And so I'm interested for, um, Clay, especially for small businesses, uh, recently, um, I think it has more of a direct integration to HubSpot, but I think they're coming out with, um, and I think, I think they're coming out. There's a way that you can integrate it into other tools like outreach and stuff, mm-hmm. but I think they're going to build out those integrations more. So once they have maybe more of those enterprise level, integrations, then maybe more of our, um, customers will start using it, but it's still on my radar. And yeah, I feel like that's like one that comes to mind. There's obviously like other tools. I I will say that like everyone always asks me about the composable tech stack and mm-hmm. they want me to say like, Oh, you should like use middleware for all of your automation and stuff like that. And I think that that's really hard to do and is really hard to staff and and so forth. But I do think that some of those tools um, that do some of the automation, like Zapier and stuff, you can do some mm-hmm. really cool things with it. So I think marketers should get more savvy and in, in even just like learning how they can maybe leverage Zapier plus chat GPT or mm-hmm. AI and so forth. Because I think there's a lot of efficiencies you can do there or improvements. But I still think like HubSpot is actually doing a better job at targeting the enterprise, although I'm interested to see if they get bought by Google and if that Mm -hmm. like continues. But so but I think having a platform there, um, I think I'm also interested to see what comes out of like new market automation platforms and leveraging AI. So this is less around like what we're using now, but more of kind of where I'm 
So none like, of these are recommendations. All of them are what you're seeing in the market and what you're interested in. Yeah. But I, and that's my recommendation to marketers actually is there's the traditional tools. And I think there's a lot of really great ones that are good for B2B companies. Um, but I, I think now where I'm interested is trying to figure out some of these um, new tools that are leveraging AI or how you can incorporate more AI into the business process that um, seems interesting. And I, it's taken me a while to get to that point because I'm very, always very skeptical and I think mm -hmm. we still need to be skeptical of it. But I think it's good to for operators to keep an eye on. All right. I have many more questions, but I want to be respectful of your time. And I also have a call coming up, which I just pushed by a couple of minutes. Thank you so much for your time. This was really fun. If people want to dive further into go-to-market operations, uh, we'll link up both CS2, your company and your LinkedIn in the show notes so they can check you out, connect with you, start a conversation, maybe, uh, Soon you'll need to update all of your messaging around GTM ops. <laughs> um, but Chrissy, thank you so much for your time. This was fun. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed it.